The Thieves Guild by Jake Kerr. Episode 66 Dragon Road. After dozens of hours of scouring history books, Rafe found the key to everything in a very old book on clothing. It was small and thin, and he couldn't even remember why he had opened it. There was a colour drawing on the cover, very finely preserved. Perhaps he wanted to see more of the drawings. Whatever the reason, it unlocked Ness's history. The book was organised by rarity and while it was full of ornate and beautiful designs, the most expensive clothes were simple. It was why they were expensive that was important. The description read, Spun from the gossamer threads of small worms, this material can only be found in the forests around Draki, far to the east and at the end of Dragon Road. When the Magic Guild brought the mountain down and permanently blocked the road, the material, known commonly as liquid cloth, became impossible to procure. As such, it is highly valued not just for its luxurious feel, but its great rarity. By then, Rafe had a good idea that the road running through the center of Ness, marked by broad flat stones, most likely ran west all the way past the outlands to a huge expanse of water and a city called Callisto on its coast and east past the mountains and through a forest to a city called Draki. He also knew that there was a West Ness, which he lived in, and an East Ness, which was strange and unknown. As far as he knew, however, there was no way through the mountain linking the two cities. So, what was this road? It seemed impossible to carve a road through the mountain. There were the mines, of course, but even carving out soft coal was an arduous process. How could someone run a road through it? When Rafe had looked at the dotted line on his map, he had first assumed that it was a treacherous path up and over the mountain, a path long destroyed by storms and landslides. Now he had an answer. The there was a road these. through the mountain, but the Magic Guild destroyed it. But where? Of the three big questions that bothered Rafe, it was the one he could answer. All he had to do was follow the road into the mountain. While he was doing that, he could use the time to ponder his other two unanswered questions. What happened to the Magic Guild, and what was the origin of the Thieves' Guild? There was no head of the stables yet, but the guild knights overseeing the tower found Rafe a gentle horse that wouldn't be too hard for him to control, as he wasn't very comfortable on horseback. The trail along the wall was smooth and without rocks, making the trip fairly easy as he led the horse east along the wall, toward the river and the road he knew would be waiting for him. While there were no detailed maps of the old quarter, common sense told Rafe that the road through the mountains would be on this side of the river. Ness, when it was a merchant centre, had been on this side of the river, with things only changing during the Great Migration. That meant that the road led from the former location of the Great Gate along the river and then over another bridge that crossed the Old Fork a bridge long since destroyed, and along the river and then up into the mountain, which was where Rafe was heading. To the river and then the road that would take him into the mountain. Rafe shook his head. As he revealed one answer, new questions were raised. Why was the former gate blocked? Why was the large bridge over the old fork torn down? Why was the important trade route through the mountain destroyed? It was as if at the same time the city wanted to expel the wizards, shut down the trade routes and create the thieves, all while erasing all evidence of it happening. Rafe had been travelling for more than two hours with the immense ash fields to his left and the wall to his right. The ash fields were aptly named, with nothing but dust and dry dirt as far as he could see, and signs of life living only on the distant horizon. 
The smaller wall that blocked the ash fields from the view of the new parts of Ness came into view just as Rafe reached the road. To Rafe's surprise, the road didn't follow the river, but rather curved away from it somewhere to the north. From his vantage point, it looked like the river was a good two miles beyond the road at this point. In the distance, Rafe could make out a massive waterfall that emerged from the mountain and created the Great River. Even from this distance, he could hear the crashing sound of water falling on rocks and continuing as a river. It was easy to see, as the great wall around Ness ended at the road and didn't block the view in the distance. The sudden sound of a clip-clop from his horse's hooves broke Rafe's reverie over his surroundings. He was on the Dragon Road. It was paved in flat stones and was wide enough to fit three wagons across. He wasn't sure who kept the road up, but it appeared well cared for. As he turned to the right to follow the road into the mountain, it was all right there in front of him, a broad arch that covered a dark entrance into a tunnel. Following the road, Rafe crossed the threshold under the arch. There were two immense sconces on each side of the arch as he entered, but they were unlit. He was a little nervous making his way into the dark, but the road was just as clear inside the entrance as it was outside. Rafe wondered how far he could make it before having to come back another day with torches. There were torches on the wall in regular intervals, but like the large decorative ones at the entrance, they were unlit. As his eyes got better, used to the increasing dark, he realized that there was no need for light. About fifty yards inside the tunnel, the road was completely blocked. It looked as if the entire mountain had collapsed on the road. Boulders the size of two wagons and larger were stacked from left to right, blocking everything. The ceiling looked like it had collapsed or was somehow brought down by an incredible power. Dismounting from his horse, Rafe looked at the collapse more closely. There were smaller rocks in between the larger ones, and as far as he could see, there wasn't even room for a mouse to make its way through the barrier. Rafe nodded and walked back to his steed. There was a road that led through the mountain, but it had been blocked centuries before. The Failed Mission Larson hadn't been in such a good mood since before his brother was named the Guildmaster Thief. Everything was finally back to going his way. The problematic Harvest Guild families were under lock and key, their houses burned to the ground, and the rest of the guild was about to be swept into the wretched quarter. His deal to the members of the guild would be welcomed. Join up with the merchants, and you can return to your homes. The only loose end didn't matter anymore. The Outlanders. Larson had just been informed that Karch had returned from his mission. Larson didn't care if Karch was successful or not. He was just glad he had returned. His presence would help immensely with managing the relocation efforts. There was a knock on his office door, and Larson rose to uncharacteristically meet his deputy. Why not? He was in a good mood. He may as well share the good cheer. Karch entered, looking his normal grim self. Larson walked toward him with his hand outstretched. Why the frown, Karch? While you were gone, I've solved our problems. Larson swept his hand toward his couch, a place he'd rarely used to meet with Karch. Come, let us update each other. Karch stared at Larson for a moment and replied, Of course, Guildmaster. Larson's goodwill ended at the couch, and he didn't offer Karch a glass of the ever-present water on the table. Larson leaned back. So how did things go with the Outlanders? Karch's voice was flat and emotionless. They shot my guards off their horses at the entrance to their city. I would have been captured if it weren't for Raylan. Larson's jaw dropped at the mention of Raylan's name, while Karch's face was emotionless. Larson took a breath. He couldn't show surprise or weakness to his inferiors. Clenching his teeth, he replied, Tell me, the accursed outlander shot my horse out from under me. 
As their guards approached on foot, Raylan galloped in on his horse, gave me a hand, and pulled me up. I then escaped. You escaped? What about Raylan? Larson couldn't believe what he was hearing. I threw him off the horse. Larson laughed. Dead at the hands of the Outlanders. Fantastic catch. A failure in your first mission turned into success in a second. Raylan is alive. What do you mean? Larson's voice was strained. He hated being made a fool, and his deputy was now doing just that. Do not toy with me, Karch. I am not toying with you, Guildmaster. Karch lowered his head. I merely have not concluded my story. As Karch looked up, Larson nodded his head impatiently. I was on the road back to Ness, when Raylan passed me on a large and fresh horse. I can only imagine that it was given to him by the Outlanders. Before Larson could cut in, Karch continued. I can only assume that he went on his own mission there. There are rumours of Allard being sympathetic to the Outlanders, and perhaps Raylan was going there for help. Whatever reason he was visiting them, he overtook me at the time of their attack. After I threw him off the horse, it appears that the Outlanders welcomed him. Larson squeezed the arms of his chair so tight that not only his knuckles, but his fingers also turned white. So, Raylan has the Outlanders defending him. The thought outraged him. His own family turned traitor to Ness. Still, it was perhaps a blessing. Larson took a breath and loosened his hands. It matters not. Raylan is now an enemy of Ness. We know this and can use it. He is back in the city and can do no more harm via the dangerous help of the Outlanders. So for now, he's not worth discussing. Yes, that seems right, Larson thought. It is perhaps wise to keep an eye on him. Larson's temper rose again. And how do you suppose we do that, Karch? Do you volunteer to wander into the wretched quarter and watch over him? Do you have some network of vile scum that live over there that can tell you? Do you? No, sir. Let me tell you why it doesn't matter. I've worked with Orion on a new plan. It is perfect because it requires nothing of a guildmaster vote or risky assassinations. All it requires is us to move some people, and then kindly offer them a return. But here, let me outline it for you. I will need your help. Larson's good mood returned as he outlined his entire plan, starting with the description that was his new favourite, killing the body of the snake to destroy the head. In this instance, the body would be the Harvest Guild members and the head would be the soon-to-be-deposed Guildmaster, Polo. As Larson was outlining how the first night had gone, Karch interrupted him. Not quite believing that Karch had the gall to stop his fantastic overview, Larson once again gripped his chair. Sir, you do understand that the Harvest Guild is the largest by far in Ness. Their membership is not just in the Flats and Lower Triangle. They have important families in the Upper Triangle, as well as large numbers of families that live in the Harvest District itself, not to mention those that live in the Outer Fields and the Mines. Any kind of physical confrontation has a low likelihood of success. Do you think I'm an idiot, Karch? Larson took a few breaths. He was tempted to pull a dagger on Karch for his insubordination, but Karch's years of service made Larson keep at least a modicum of control over his temper. No, sir, it's just... Say another word and you'll end up in the dungeon. Karch didn't move, his face once again devoid of any expression. This is not a call for civil war, you dolt. We're imprisoning the troublemakers and the members who no one cares about. Those in the flats and the lower triangle. It will be enough to call for Polo's dismissal, and then embrace the merchant guild as their brothers. Karch stared at Larson. What I need you to do is to oversee the relocation efforts. Get every Harvest Guild member in the flats and the lower triangle to the wretched quarter. I don't care how you get them there. Just get them there. Drag them across the bridge if you have to. After taking a deep breath, Karch replied. So I am to oversee the relocation of hundreds of families across the bridge. And by doing that, we will offer ourselves as saviours and welcome them into our guild to bring them home. Exactly. Larson didn't like Karch's tone and wasn't quite sure why his deputy, who had served him well for many years, was suddenly hesitant. Perhaps the attack by the Outlanders had scared him. Yes, that must be it, Larson thought. Look, Karch, I understand you've just survived an attack and a gruelling journey. Get with Pattis. 
he will give you an update on everything and present you with more details. After talking to him, you'll understand. Karch bowed his head. Yes, sir. I will discuss this with Pattis right away. Very good. Larson waved Karch toward the door. You are dismissed. He watched as his deputy slowly walked out of his office. For all of Karch's exhausted confusion, Larson was glad he was back. While the plan was strong, having Karch execute the details meant it was destined to succeed. <laughs>